Welcome to the Sustainable Region. I'm Dagmar Timmer. Today, we're broadcasting the question and answer session from one of Metro Vancouver's Future of the Region Sustainability Dialogues. This session features five presentations on strengthening the regional food network in a global economy. This program is also available online at metrovancouver.org. Okay, the mics are now open, so please, uh, when you're going to speak, please identify yourself. So, uh, can we have the uh, first question? Don. Primarily to the first presenter, uh, in terms of uh, accomplishing the cultural shift, how do you actually persuade, uh, shall I say, comfortable people that there really is uh, a genuine emergency uh, at the present time, which can be uh, legitimately compared to the recognized emergency back in the uh, early mid uh, 1940s. I think it depends on who you're talking to. There are, are several, there are people that are, are pursuing solutions that will achieve uh, benefits in, in regionalizing the, the food economy for different reasons. I mean, there's an obesity epidemic worldwide. 1.6 billion people are overweight or obese. Their, their lifespans are shrinking, their quality of life is shrinking, and, and a lot of people have you know, friends or family members that have diabetes or heart disease, and, and this alone is enough motivation for many people to say, wow, I want to improve the food systems of the schools so that my children don't develop these bad dietary norms and go in that direction, or, or create alternatives uh, you know, to McDonald's and, and uh, you know, processed foods, and I want to create new ideas of ways that people can enjoy cooking again. The slow food movement is interesting. I, I'm, I'm horrified by the fact that we now spend eight minutes a day on cooking. That, I mean, that, that is shocking and it's horrible because there's no way you can prepare anything healthy in eight minutes. That means you're going and you're buying either mac and cheese or pizza or some other toxic thing that isn't really even food. Mark. Uh, just one short observation. There's a sense of urgency and panic in our culture right now around a quite a few things. The food system is a land use, market, government mess all woven together. And what I think is wise in terms of your cultural shift is to plan a multi, multi-decade evolution and start by a relentless but same approach to start to shift things one, two percent at a time, year by year, half decade by half decade, through a slow, relentless process of policy, market intervention, cultural development. But if we sit down and start relentlessly pushing by 2050, you'd be surprised what we could achieve. Okay, thank you, panel. We're going to go to the next question now, sir. Thanks, Peter. My name is Grant Rice. I'm with the Surrey Urban Farmers Market and the Farmland Defense League. Uh, Wendy touched on the issue of the ALR. It seems to be under constant assault here in the Lower Mainland. So leadership, there's a void, and uh, I'd like to ask a question to Alan. The government seems to listen to business. Maybe business could pick up this uh, leadership void and uh, be a voice for the ALR. Alan? So I think... Uh that's a difficult question. I think from our perspective, we're looking at BC as kind of a pilot uh, jurisdiction for how retailers can take a more active role in encouraging local production as an industry as opposed to just individual retailers, many of whom do take an active role in different jurisdictions. Okay, thank you, Alan. Wendy. We have a tremendous muzzling of professionals in this province. Let me say that one more time. We have an unacceptable level of muzzling of professionals in this province. Professionals who've been trained through education, supported by your tax dollars, who have come out of your homes, who have wanted to make a difference in the world, and they are being muzzled from contributing to vital public discussions by employers of provincial government who's saying you are not allowed to talk. And I think this is one of our problems. Thank you very much. We're going to go to the next question. Yeah. The lady standing at the mic. Do I? Okay. Ellen Liberman. Somebody has to go first. I think it's incumbent on government and business to accept short-term pain for long-term gain. Too many grocers, when I challenge them about waste in packaging, composting, um, the types of foods they offer tell me, well, that's not what our consumers ask for. 
grocers and marketers have a huge opportunity to um, teach consumers what they need. So one question is, to what extent will grocers pick up that gauntlet? I think you have to remember packaging does play a role in terms of food safety. Um, so I think that you, while we're doing a number of things to address the sustainability of packaging, uh, the one thing we won't do is compromise the food safety of our products, and that's always a top concern. And you know, an example I use often is the you know the plastic wrap on a cucumber. You know, on average, that preserves the product for an extra four days. So if you don't have that plastic wrap, then you could eventually you know the product might decay before you ever use it. And if you look at it from a carbon footprint perspective, the carbon footprint involved in adding that thin little sheen of plastic as opposed to losing the entire good of that cucumber is it's significant. I'm sorry, I have to. Uh, I'm not trying to become enemies, but <laughs> plastic on cucumbers? I mean, th that is, it's this, uh, sorry, I'm not plugging State of the World, but, but the cover of State of the World is, made, is an image by Chris Jordan made out of 2.4 million pieces of plastic. That's the number in pounds of plastic that enter the world's oceans every hour. Okay? This is the scale of the, the crisis that we're in. And to, to save two more days of, of cucumbers' life uh, by putting it in plastic is outrageous. Let's localize the cucumber production, and it will last six days longer because it hasn't been shipped from Mexico. Hi, Vanessa Timmer from One Earth. Um, Mark, you were saying that the regional food system really, it's a marathon, and that we're going to be you know, slow and steady until 2050. And I like that image of the marathon. It made me think about the fact that when people are running marathons, there are celebrations along the way. There's bands, there's people with you know, nutrition <laughs> to keep you going. And I think there is a real, my theory of social change is we really need to be signaling to each other that we are moving that marathon in the right direction so that we can keep building the momentum. So what are those quick wins? What are the ways we can celebrate that we're moving in the right direction, that there are seeds being planted? So I think as well as thinking about that longer term, how do we get those quick wins along the way? Okay, thanks, Vanessa. So uh, I think uh, you're online first, Mark. Uh, direct question there. Uh, what are the quick wins? How can we reward ourselves on this journey? And it's been explained, you know, 2050, decades. Your ideas? Yeah, it's good. In order to identify what a win is, we'll need to set some targets for performance that we can achieve. So when we've agreed, when when the numbers show in 10 years we've shifted the local food budget 5% to locally produced food, and someone, let's say like Eric's group or someone else's group, is reporting on it or yours, that's exciting. We can have a party around that. Okay, thank you, Mark. So. Natalie, I'm a student at Simon Fraser University, and I want to pick up on the earlier discussion about food security. We are not all equally food insecure. If we say our we is Metro Vancouver, a regional government that doesn't have an explicit mandate for, for justice or for food, um, officially, if we choose that as our we, what can Metro Vancouver be doing to try and create not only a sustainable, but also a just regional food economy? Ma, would you like to kick off that one? It's a great question. Uh, each agency needs to work with the tools and jurisdictions they have, and no single one. It's the coolest thing about a capitalist society and the most scary when we are staring sustainability challenges in the face is that nobody's actually in charge. Um, each government has a little bit of control of a few things and a lot to lose by doing, you know, by making change. I think what Metro is doing right here is one of the most powerful and underused tools local government has, which is the role of a convener, because under their flag, it's an important discussion because they are government, and enough governments don't either have the capacity or inclination to do that. This is a very powerful role for a regional government that doesn't have a lot of heavy hammers to get all of us building synapses and connections between each other. So I, I think it's a combination of using their tools tools for water, wastewater, land use, transportation systems to make sure the region supports a food system, but also to be this educator. Okay, Wendy. And I think also um, uh, local governments uh, have a tremendous ability to sort of go viral with these concepts across other local governments when they get together through the UBCM and, and the uh, federal equivalent. And the ability of local governments to um, 
pass things like local food charters and talk about food democracy, which is what the last several questions have been about, I, I think is a very potent avenue for change because when this gets adopted by municipalities across the province, all of a sudden it becomes very, very difficult for uh, higher levels of government to ignore. Okay, thank you, panel. Huge question, of course, food security and social justice put together there. Thank you very much for the question. Hi, Thank my you. name is um, Jody Peters, and I'm a permaculture, uh, permaculture design consultant as well, working on a project with the Environmental Youth Alliance um, called the Backyard Bounty Collective. My question to the panel, I'm not sure who is in a good position to answer this, is what sort of on a global level is a livable amount of one's income to spend on food? So um, like that kind of addresses it across doesn't matter how much you make, but what percentage of your income is reasonable to expect to spend on food in a sustainable food system? I think that, I mean, that question is one of choice. In a lot of cases, if you have the money, it's your choice. <clears throat> but if you look at what we spend uh, in North America, 7 to 11% of our disposable income on food. If you go to Europe, it ranges between 18 and 22%. If you go to India and, 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 and more third world countries, it's 50 to 60% of their disposable income goes to sustain their life. That's not a choice. That's what they have to do. So um, those aren't choices that they make in those countries. That's that's what it is. Uh, I think that uh, quickly to get to a different place where we look at food differently is we relate it to different things. We we relate it to our health. People go to a grocery store. What do you see in the majority of your major grocery stores now in the center piece? It's a pharmacological garden of supplements that you now have to take because your food system is such a pile of crap. So if you want to devote all that money to pills, go for it. But you could take all that pill money and put it into real food, and that would change your mindset. Um, I think it's really a question of how many hours should we have to work a month to be able to put food on the table rather than percentage of income, because it's a little bit less discretionary and more about uh, the value of our of our work. Yeah, James Andrew, uh, in from Langley, I guess I've got an interest in touching on food safety again, because I think sometimes the drive for perfect food safety sets up barriers to some of the things we're trying to accomplish. And I was hoping, like, with these people in the room, I'm just curious, by a show of hands, how many people feel the food system is safe enough for them today, if anybody. I do. But there's, uh, there's a lot of people that don't, so I'm just wondering if, uh, in terms of prioritizing how to look at food safety and local food, if the panel has any priorities about what needs to be addressed. You mentioned small-scale processing as being hard to set up. So that's my curiosity there. Okay, thanks. Alan, on the food safety side, you've been sitting back, Alan. I've noticed this, so I'm just bringing you forward. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if there's much I can add. Like I understand the concern. You know, I think from our perspective, food safety is a top priority. Obviously, the federal government weighs in with some pretty strict regulations. You know, and, um, and we adhere to those. Um, in terms of its impact on small-scale processors, I understand the difficulties, but I don't know from our perspective that there's much we can offer in terms of a solution. For from our perspective, we're just trying to keep up and deal with the food safety issues that we have on a daily basis, and and they're getting more complex all the time. If you concentrate on food safety to the level that we are concentrating on food safety right now, you will eliminate local food production. And that's what the scary part, and I see Herb Way nodding there with the whole meat, the whole meat issue is that if we centralize and centralize based on the fact that we have meat issues in these massive plants where a hamburger consists of a thousand pieces of different cows uh, in your hamburger that you're eating, and you take that system and you try to put it onto an abattoir uh, that is slaughtering three animals a week, the abattoir is out of business. So I think we need food safety, yes, but we need it to fit the system. We can't take these huge plants that need a certain level of food safety and transfer that system onto our local food economy or we don't have one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Francesca Gesualdi. I'm um, with a social enterprise called Food Wisdom, uh, along with my sister, the chef here. We deliver um, food literacy programs to youth in inner city high schools, and I feel very, very privileged to be doing that kind of work. It's uh, very rewarding, actually. And I wanted to make a couple comments. First of all, about the eight-minute um, cooking time. Uh, 
Kids love to cook. Once we get into a classroom and get them rattling them pots and pans, there's no way we can get rid of them in eight minutes. I mean, they just, you know, so there's hope. But I'm actually speaking because I wanted to raise a conscientious objection to the characterization of hunger as a niche problem. Um, you know, something that happens sort of just randomly naturally occurs and, you know, we don't really can't control it. It's a very complex problem. Um, however, it's a problem that's very foreign to Mother Nature. Mother Nature doesn't naturally create hunger. Man, you know, it's a man-made thing and it's a man-made, um, you know, problem. It's, all of us are responsible for eradicating it. And I, I'd like to see it on the agenda uh, more visibly because otherwise it's kind of, you know, pushed under the rug. I, I just, again, not to pick on Mark, but uh, I, I, sometimes I'm ashamed to live in BC. We have the highest uh, child hunger and child poverty rate in the country. I'd like to eradicate hunger, please. Thank you. Well, now you've picked on Mark. I'm going to have to ask Mark to reply. Even though we're not in a debate, it's a dialogue. <laughs> no, not picking on me at all. It's a great, it's a great point to raise. Um, and we probably actually agree. I probably didn't frame my comment very well from years in city planning trying to trying to find solutions and working on the edges of social planning and working kind of on the edges of the downtown east side in some cases the the solutions were always very complex and 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 that's what i was trying to get at is that the is that it's not a mass group that we can just you know do one thing and it'll solve the problem the 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 hunger is an out it's a symptom of a much deeper challenge in order to learn how what to do in a kitchen you actually have to have someone like yourself, if you didn't get it at home, someone has to show you what to do in the kitchen. And in a time before mass amounts of fast food, our mothers, fathers, grandmothers taught us this. Um, uh, maybe our schools taught us that. If those things fail, we don't have that learning process. And so there's a lot of human emotional investment, and that's a, that's a relationship oriented. And when I meant niche, I don't mean as in only a few people are hungry. What I meant is the solutions require a lot of one-on-one -on -one and that that I guess in a technical term is like a niche there's certain people who will respond to certain things and others need other types of help and that's how we're going to have to be able to get through this not to say there aren't other general policy directions we can take there are, of course are that we can tilt the playing field a little better um, but the answer to hunger is actually going to be I think in a whole lot of relationships and a lot of people like yourselves committing a lot of emotional <laughs> time to engaging that problem on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. A quick one, Wendy, before we go yeah, to the next I, question. I <coughs> Pardon me, I, ju I just wanted to, um, I guess, congratulate um, Mark Bomford and, and all the people who worked so hard on the UBC farm to get that entrenched as, uh, as a viable, successful, uh, at its present footprint going forward, because the UBC farm is doing a lot of really important things, bringing urban youth out there and doing the same sort of things that, that you're talking about, um, creating that connection between uh, the children who are less privileged to live in the cities and bringing food to a much more important part in their life. So. Okay, thank you, Wendy. The lady in blue. Good afternoon, my name is Diane Ramage. I'm with the Pacific Salmon Foundation. I'd like to talk about wild food for a moment. Um, as we go towards close utilization of land to make sure that we have um, agriculture areas, that homes have victory gardens, where we call them, I'm a third generation victory garden owner, and um, how are we going to accommodate the production of wild food, salmon being one of them? People forget that more than 10 million salmon came back to the regional living area, to the Metro Vancouver area last year alone. That, we hear about the sockeye crisis, but no one's talking about the abundance of pink salmon that provides protein and nutrients, as well as being a keystone species and an ecosystem indicator to the public. It, this is food in the commons that is readily available, that is wonderful. And as we start to farm every inch to be able to accommodate these other things. And I heard Wendy say that water should be reserved for agriculture. But when are we going to start looking at the best use of land and making sure that we're growing the appropriate product that's there and still allowing space for wild food, which might be people that want to hunt deer in the, you know, the Chilliwack Valley, or people that have the right and the ability to access salmon, or the importance of having safe places for pollinators that are free of pesticides that are actually the drivers of many of these other foods that we rely on for agriculture. Where is the planning that allows for that in the face of climate change, increased population, and the need for growing agriculture for areas that are arid, even within our own province? Okay. Thank you very much. 
Any responses from there? Yes, Eric. Yeah, it, again, I mean, this is where I'm really, my mind has been shifted by my own research, which I guess is a good thing. But apply, applying these six institutions, this, it's a methodology that offers you, okay, how do we promote wild food? Uh, education is so important. I mean, I've taken some w urban foraging courses now where I've learned all these different foods that I saw as weeds. You know, garlic mustard pesto I've made now in, in Washington, and, and you can make acorn flour out of the oak trees, and, and all these things are just garbage in most people's eyes, you know, litter on the grounds. But you can apply different things, you know, having, creating some foraging courses, and that can be a social enterprise, social marketing, marketing of wild foods, working with restaurants, working with local religious leaders to promote these ideas of the importance of wild food to uh, preserving God's creation. I mean, using the right language depending on who you're talking to. So there's all different ways to really promote wild food, and, and I'm excited to see you're in the audience, and I, I, I hope that you're really, that, that's great to hear that there's a, an effort to really uh, promote this. Okay, we're going to move on now, and this, uh, unfortunately, is going to be our last question. Oh, that's great. Um, so uh, my, my question is, uh, first to Mark, is uh, we see a lot of things uh, being, um, a lot of expertise being siloed and a lot of things being um, put into different disciplines. When are we going to see, uh, in your opinion, that we are going to have some integrated community planning so that we can have um, aging in place issues, food security issues, um, mental health issues, um, a lot, well, obesity, everything can be, can be resolved with the uh, with a more uh, coherent planning. I can only see that uh, moving quicker than my death uh, if uh, we can have some um, pilot projects or pioneer community. Do you see the possibility of, of it happening in Metro Vancouver that we have one community, whole community, that can demonstrate that? And um, the second thing about food safety is um, I haven't been taking any plastic bag um, when I buy grocery, but I. I've been throwing away bits and pieces every day. So um, I go back to, um, in some different traditions, uh, or even here, we see a lot of public markets which create a little bit less um, plastic waste. Will we be able to see two different modes of uh, food safety? One is making sure that the large grocery retailer, who they don't have personal attention to the piece of good put on the shelf, they are subjected to one standard. Whereas the people who take care of the produce that they sell directly to their clients that they meet every day, they are subjected to a different standard, which is probably monitored by, by the, the credit of their performance by inspector. I mean, a lot of, of other parts in the world, they use a lot more food inspectors than we use here. Um, that's my comment. Okay, thank you, Wilma. Mark, that was very much addressed to you. The integrated community plan, the all-encompassing integrated community <laughs> plan. <laughs> thank you. It's a, it's a, it's a marvellous question to sort of end the discussion on um, because food, again, has not been on a lot of the planning horizons for the last several decades, and now it is. Uh, a couple of observations around that. It's very difficult for governments to embody the complexity of society within the roles, uh, within the staff they have um, and the roles that they have. And the story we heard otherwise here about sort of muzzling or the, the complexities of the politics of dialogue and government. The way that we've seen in all the communities we've worked in that this happens the best is with the community advisory groups. So it's an interesting practice. I'll use West Van right now, the leadership there that's been, ex been moving forward around working groups on every major project that are comprised of knowledgeable, interested, or stakeholders of some sort. And they simply take the time it takes to have the conversation required to make sure that all the issues have been sufficiently raised and worked through. Nothing's perfect. But having been part of a number of those projects in the last few years, it's actually really quite something to see the sophistication that emerges from that community discussion. One of the things that everyone involved in that process has to come to accept is that the integrated process is messy and slow. And often there's not enough money to pay for facilitators, to pay for the discussion to occur. And so, and, and each participant in it has to feel responsible for what they can do to find 
a both and, a win-win solution, and which is not so much finger pointing as sleeves rolled up. Here's a way, let's work together. Help me understand a lot of listening going on. And it's a new way of governance. And I think if we look ahead, we're going to find that to your point, the pendulum of governance at local levels is going to, is shifting away from at one time governments did very little. And then it swung to where governments, we expected an enormous amount from them and paid large taxes for it. And now we're not so much swinging back as swinging to a different place where we government attempt to coordinate all of these different voices to find a solution for their community that works forward. It never works easily. It's always a messy, complex process. But I think if we look 30, 40 years ahead, your point about it needing to be integrated is absolutely necessary. And we also can't afford to pay other people to do all of that. So it's going to call forth a new citizenship, a new responsibility, a new volunteerism amongst us all to engage those conversations proactively in, in a solutions-oriented way. If we can do that, I think we're going to find local culture and local identity and better solutions emerging. Uh, we aren't quite there yet, so voices like yours asking for it, bringing it forward, keeping it on the table are absolutely necessary. But I think there's actually some very good times ahead as we learn better to work together as communities to build the communities that we want. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, that uh, brings me to the end of the, the dialogue session. And I'd really like to thank everybody for their participation. That was the Q&A for strengthening the regional food network, one of a series of dialogues presented by Metro Vancouver. You can download the original dialogue from Metro Vancouver's website. Email us your comments regarding this topic at sustainableregion at metrovancouver.org or call 604-436-6794. Thanks for watching the Sustainable Region. I'm Doc Timmer. See you next time.